and and, and uh, thing that we're building together. Appreciate uh, all the speakers, uh, and so that brings me to today's speaker, which is Jan Talley, and I think I'll turn it over to Miss Shelley Boyer to now introduce our today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Stoddinger. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Talley today. Dr. Talley received an undergraduate degree in psychology along with an MSW in social work from Syracuse University. She went on to complete her MA in cognitive psychology as well as her PhD in behavioral psychology from the University of Kansas. Through her research, Dr. Talley has been able to test the effect of a self-management curriculum on patient outcomes for adolescents who have been diagnosed with PTSD. Dr. Talley teaches two courses for KCU College of Medicine, including Introduction to Research Methods and Basic Introduction to Research Methods. Dr. Talley has also organized boot camp training and grant writing for KCU professors and currently directs the Summer Student Research Fellowships at KCU. To these endeavors, Dr. Talley brings a wealth of experience from her time as a project director for a four-year study for the National Institute on Drug Abuse, her experience as a monitor for the Jackson County Mental Health Levy Fund for 10 years, and knowledge gained from teaching undergraduate students at Blue River Metropolitan Community College for eight years. I've had the pleasure of working with and getting to know Dr. Talley, and it is my pleasure to introduce her today. Um, if everyone could please mute their mics and um, raise their hands, I'd be happy to help moderate any questions. Um, Dr. Talley, I will hand it over to you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, this is something that you probably know um, nothing about. You probably have never heard about it. But I'm doing this uh, presentation in honor of Shelley. Uh, Dr. Stoddinger and Shelley and I have been working on a um, study down in Joplin for a while now. And uh, one of the things that I inserted into the study was something called social validity. And Shelley kept saying, what is that? What is that? And so I uh, uh, decided that this would be a good time to explain it. And Shelley asked me when I gave her choices of what I could talk about, she said, oh, yeah, do that one. Do social validity. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Social validity. What is it? Why do we need it? And how do we do it? Now, you may all think that social validity has nothing to do with medicine, but in fact, it has a lot to do with it. The transfer of this uh, construct and concept have not been made uh, except very infrequently in the field of epidemiology. Um, so now I'm going to make that transfer for you. And uh, it, it is a difficult transfer to make in the sense that um, you're talking about behaviors of patients, but they are not static or finite. It's about pro a process. So. Albert Einstein said, we cannot use the same thinking to solve problems that we use to create them. Well, social validity is a problem. And uh, the ways that we have had to try it in the past in terms of treatment have not worked well. Um, compliance to treatment has been very low. So one of the problems, especially in the United States, is that we have, we have treatments, we have cures but patients don't necessarily see those treatments through. Uh, anyone who's ever worked with some uh, one with breast cancer and who's taking tamoxifen knows the likelihood that noncompliance will occur. Social validity is another way of describing that noncompliance because social validity is it's subjective, it's ongoing, and it measures the response categories of patients to treatment protocols. So social validity for patients, it would be the acceptability of the treatment protocol for the patient. And this is why the word social is in there. It's, it's a type of validity, but it is directed at the validity for the patient. So it's the acceptability of the treatment protocol, the importance of treatment outcomes. So how important are are those outcomes that you have uh, developed for the patient's treatment that are actually important to the patient? And there is a difference. Also, significance of the goals to improve health. Uh, so how significant are those goals going to be 
once you re reach them in terms of helping the, the patient feel better. So social validity is on a continuum. It's not dichotomous. It's not nominal. And there are many degrees of social validity. So how, um, how do we know that um, the procedures are acceptable as part of a treatment protocol for the patient? We want to know, are they acceptable to the patient? They need to be acceptable to the physician, obviously, because you're going to pick a protocol that treats and it has a likelihood of success. But is the patient going to continue and see, see it through to the end? Um, so we accept acceptability of the procedures by asking the patient. So we say on an ongoing basis during treatment, what are the good and the bad aspects of this protocol for you? Um, is there a willingness to recommend others? So is the patient finding something that they want you to try? Are you willing to try it? Uh, so those are all parts of that uh, interaction between the physician and the patient. And then it also has to do with overall satisfaction with treatment. How satisfied is the patient with treatment? Because if the patient isn't satisfied, they likely are going to discontinue. So one of the ways you can look at this, you can see if, they're, um, if the treatment is acceptable, you can observe um, these following metrics. One is attendance. Do they show up at, your, at the office visits? Do they show up for treatment? Do they show up for telehealth meetings? Um, and, and when they do, do they actually participate? So do they attend, do they participate? Do they complete tasks? For instance, if you ask them to track something like their medication um, self-administration, do they actually track it? Uh, if they don't, they probably don't find that a meaningful activity. It's kind of a waste of their time. The other way we know that it's happening is sustainability. Does the treatment last beyond the initial introduction? So is the treatment protocol sustained over time? Does the patient participate over time? So how do we do it? How do we increase acceptability? And I'm going to go into this very specifically in terms of physician behaviors later on. Uh, but to increase acceptability, and these, this is of the protocol, so is the actual protocol, the procedure itself, acceptable to the patient? Listen to the patient's perspective. Um, also, include a, the patient's choice for protocols, because when you allow them to take part in the choice of the protocol, parts of it, anything you can give them to choose, it makes the, uh, the protocol more reinforcing, um, and it makes it more effective. So, also, use evidence-based practices and effective procedures. So, if a, if a patient is looking at a procedure that you're recommending and, and you can hand them an article or you can uh, give them a website to go to where there are studies that describe what you're gonna do. That's always a good thing. Also, um, if it's effective, if they can see an effect. And that's why when you're trying to get that patient buy-in, you wanna start with something that's gonna give them um, as immediate a, a positive response as possible, if possible. Um, so acceptable procedures correlate with improved health outcomes. So if the procedures are acceptable, patients participate. And if they're not, they won't. So how important is the outcome in terms of so social validity? So is the outcome of the treatment protocol important to the patient? And if it is, there's more likely to be participation. So. What is the subjective, and these are subjective measures by the patient. These are subjective in that there are emotional responses and behavioral responses. They're not necessarily um, uh, rational always. But what is the subjective outcome for the treatment protocol as it's perceived by your patient? So the patient says, I want to feel better. I want to eat all my favorite foods again. I want to be able to go have a bowl of ice cream before bedtime. Well, you know what that's going to lead to, right? Obesity, so, or diabetes, whatever. The health outcome targeted by the treating physician could be different. But the way to involve the patient is to 
pick a, an outcome that's relevant to what they want, not only to reduce A1C levels, but to allow that patient to have access to something that they didn't have before. For instance, people with severe arthritis, they may not be able to uh, bake or cook or make bread the way they used to. So what can you do if you want them to participate in your protocol to make that possible? Let's make that our goal, that, that within X number of months, I'll give you medication that will allow you to participate in bread making again. That seems simplistic, but that's uh, a way to target the patient and pull them into the treatment procedure. Make it very clear what they're gaining. So to increase patient participation in treatment, you have to be willing to incorporate the patient's targeted outcomes um, in your focus on health outcomes, because if you don't include the patient's choice, so they can even choose a reinforcer. For instance, one of the things that I used to reinforce myself with for um, working out on my um, bicycle was that I would allow myself a piece of watermelon. Um, and, and encouraging the patient to do something like that is fine. However, when you're taking a medication with some pretty serious side effects, that becomes more difficult. And sometimes um, you have to work with the patient with a nutritionist to find what that might be, or with an exercise physiologist. So outcomes for the treatment may, may be not longitudinal, and we've, we've talked about this in ILA. Um, proximal effects tend to be uh, within the first month. So proximal effects are more immediate to the uh, treatment protocol, to the beginning of it or the uh, um, end of it. Then uh, intermediate effects, we tend to look more at six months to a year. And then the distal effects, of the for looking for outcomes for the treatment still effects could be anywhere from a year on out so those are more longitudinal um, <clears throat> the outcomes that are distal are the most difficult to work with in terms of keeping the patient compliant so to do that you have to find very you have to find the little changes in their lifestyle or in their comfort level or the increase in some activity that they can do and have them track it um, in tiny little baby steps for distal effects. However, for proximal effects, um, you can usually, if, if, the, if the medication has an immediate effect, you're in luck. But if it doesn't, it takes six months, or with some psychotropic meds, it may take three weeks. Um, working with the patient along the way and saying, yes, you will experience that, and then it will lead to they begin to realize that you know what you're talking about, <laughs> and then they trust you more. Um, and then along the way, if they have some successes that you can build in, that can be really helpful for compliant, for um, social validity. Now, how significant is the goal of a treatment uh, protocol? So how much is the, the validity, the significance of the goal, what's it mean to the patient? So is it the, is it the patient's a member of a risk group? They may be obese. They're at risk for diabetes. So they're a member of that group. And risk groups describe people who share common traits. Um, and, the, uh, and the effect of that trait may cause a disease or start begin the development of a disease. For instance, it could be breast cancer. It could be prostate cancer, any one of a number of things. So identifying that known potential is the first step. Significance of the treatment goal then um, is, is increased for the patient if you look at the relative risk ratio between fitness level and all-cause mortality. So if you have someone that's obese, now remember, the way that you convey this message is also very important. If you frighten the patient, they're less likely to comply. I think you know most of you docs out there know that. But if you give them information, you say, well, try this first, see how that goes, and, and introduce more proximal steps, you, find, you usually have more success. Um, but the study that um, Blair did found that moderate fitness levels substantially reduced the risk of all-cause mortality. Well, that was a big deal. And so 
um, moderate fitness levels, walking short distances, increasing the walking distance. And there, you all know the physicians that walk with their patients, um, physicians who will meet their patients on Saturday morning with the physician and his family, and then the patients join them and they begin to go for a walk. And those kinds of things, you're reinforcing the patient by participating in that with them. You're setting, uh, you know, you're setting an example. And then also you, you have or your family member, someone has a chance to teach them um, better health behaviors. So you've got you know, kind of a sitting audience. Um, so how significant is the goal for the patient? Well, the broad social goal has to be related to the treatment goal. So with risk models, we build models using statistics to estimate risk. You know, so how likely are you to get this disease? What is the likelihood that your cancer will reoccur if you follow this treatment regimen? And so you sit there with the patient and you discuss this. You do this already. But increasing the significance of the, um, the goal, you know, to, to get rid of the cancer, that may be yours to, to reduce cancer. But the patients may be to be able to take live long enough to take a trip to... France or something like that. So remember, the goal may be different for them than it is for you. So most patients want to, to live. So if you say, you know, reduced mortality, morbidity, um, this is a goal. And I remember when I was um, overweight and I decided I was going to lose weight because I decided my goal is I'm going to be in shape for retirement. Um, well, I haven't retired yet, but I'm and I'm still trying to get in shape. But that's, the, that's socially valid for me. So what can the physician do specifically to increase social validity for the patient? So how do I get them to do it? How do I get them to participate in what I prescribe? Because you know what to do. You know what can take care of their problems or at least reduce symptoms. But patients just don't do it. So the um, teaching, academic teaching, that is set up for these, uh, for physician-doctor-patient relationships, there are seven communication tasks. Now, this is not what, about social validity. This is what you are tasked with as a physician. So you build the doctor-patient relationship. You open the discussion. You gather information. You understand the patient's perspective. You share the information with them. You tell them what the science is or you know, what they're likely to expect. You reach an agreement on problems and plans, and then you provide the closure. You sum it up for them. So first thing you have to do to, to work with patients and to get them to buy into the protocol, listen. So listen to patients to develop sustainable treatment protocols. That sounds like a very, very silly solution, but in fact, it is closely related to sustainable treatment protocols. You're listening. Okay, so physicians, patient perceptions of their physician as patient-centered has been positively linked to patient satisfaction as well as to the quality of the interaction. Now, this is really interesting. Um, the more treatment outcomes patients discussed, patients discussed with their physicians while the physician listened, the higher the patient satisfaction ratings were at baseline and again at follow-up. So physician and patient interactions in the study by uh, Marvel and others in 1999, this was a long time ago, um, physician and patient interactions were recorded and quantified during 264 office visits across the United States. The office visits that were recorded were in urban, semi-rural, in rural settings. Uh, the following behaviors were quantified, and these were uh, carefully recorded and then counted for time. The physician asked, and these were in office visits while they were occurring, the physician asked about the patient's concerns during 75% of the office visit time, of the office visits that occurred. That's out of, um, I think, 274, something, 199, the physician asked the patients 
about what their concerns were. Now, physicians redirected that interaction before the patient could complete a list of concerns 47% of the time, or in 125 of those cases. So what did that do? Patients who were allowed to complete the list of concerns, they only took six more seconds than those who were redirected. So patients saying, well, I've got this problem with my stomach and uh, you know, I, I can't get out to walk and the pill upsets, upsets me if I take it in the morning. Okay, if they get cut off after the first one, it only takes on average six more seconds to wait for the patient to recount their full, the full number of concerns. If you cut them off, then the redirection results in later rising concerns from the patient or they don't bring them up at all. They're forgotten or never mentioned because the patient perceives that you don't wanna hear them. Providers who were perceived to be responsive, empathetic and attuned to patients' needs were judged by patients as giving better care, even though in the study by Ruiz Moral, the care was exactly the same. So they took patients and um, administered the same care to both, but one, the provider uh, exhibited a different kind of behavior when interaction, interacting with the patient. So patients liked the care more, but also, and this is just, I mean, I know this is a non sequitur, they're less likely to sue. Um, so listening to all of the patient's concerns, and I know Dr. Johnson says over and over to, to his students, the most important thing you have is your um, intake with the patient, is that uh, learning about their, their health issues. So listening to all the patient's concerns was seen by the patient as more patient-centered. Patient perception of the physician as patient-centered then in turn is linked to the acceptability of treatment and the importance of the outcomes for patients. So the outcomes become more socially valid for them. They buy into them. They want to participate. So you've, you're getting social validity, and that's what that is. It's patient participation and st the sustainability of the treatment. So... Physician behaviors that are highly correlated to social validity, and I have to stress this, um, these uh, behaviors, beware of cultural differences and understand that calling a patient by the first name uh, in one culture might not be a good thing to do. But within the context of, of this particular study, calling the patient by their first name was a behavior that was highly correlated to social validity for the patient, smiling to the patient, being aware of the patient's expectations, knowing what they want from the visit, acknowledging, and that means listening to what they came in for, acknowledging how the disease is affecting the patient's life. And sometimes, and, and you've all heard this from your, from your physician, I know that may be hard, I know that sometimes you don't get to do the things you want, or, um, details of the social environment and the family circle, um, acknowledging that you know about those, or now how's your mom feeling? I know she was having some problems last time. Or I once had a, a physician who talked, who uh, who asked me how I was doing, and I mentioned uh, uh, um, a dating relationship, and he, you know, he was uh, smart enough to remember that the next time I came in. How's that going? And if it wasn't, that's an issue too. Observable, verbal, and nonverbal empathy, eye contact. Now, obviously, there are some cultures, again, I want to stress, where eye contact is not a good idea. But these are behaviors that actually have been recorded as being highly correlated to patient participation in treatment. So social validity assessments. And so now we're going to apply this to the real world, to something we're all experiencing. Social validity assessments should include negative as well as positive assessments. So we need to be able to notice when something isn't working and change how we're dealing with uh, the interaction with the patient. And that is uh, maybe a negative um, assessment of social validity. So you may say, they're not buying this. 
you know, they're, 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 uh, they're exercising, but they're not taking uh, the particular prescription on a regular basis. So you have to look at that. So let's look at the communication of risk in public health emergencies. Let's look at the public health emergency we're all experiencing now. And let's look at some of the horrors that are happening. Communication of risk in pub public health emergencies, um, if it's inconsistent, can cause fear and worry in the general population that wasn't there before. So behavioral responses to inconsistent communication of risk can actually threaten health outcomes. So the social validity for the patient is lost. They've lost their trust. In other words, the procedures, maybe they won't work. So the inconsistency of the communication is what is critical. And that's, of course, you know that's um, true in your one-on-one -on -one treatment of a patient as well. So a community is not much different in that way. So the World Health Organization has done a lot of work on looking at inconsistent risk communication. And they looked at Chernobyl 30 years later. They went there in the, in the um, after they were allowed to go in after a while. They were not allowed at first. There was a great deal of difficulty in terms of uh, risk communication. It was not consistent. People were not getting consistent information. One of the ways that this has been played out most effectively is in Israel. Uh, in Israel, where they are living in a situation where they are in, basically under constant attack or the potential for constant attack. Every time there is an attack, the news, uh, the radio, every form of communication is used to give clear and consistent information about what happened and about what the damage was. And so people relax a little bit more, I mean, if you can in that situation, and they begin to trust the communication that it will be accurate. That is the biggest um, support for, uh, for community members because they know they can trust what they're being told. Inconsistent risk communication can result in negative community responses, such as hoarding. So I want you all to think, how many of you bought a whole bunch of toilet paper in the last three or four months? Well, I didn't buy toilet paper. I bought onions and potatoes. But other people bought other things. But hoarding went on. And we saw the shelves being empty when there was no reason for that. So the World Health Organization has been studying this for a long time. And if you notice in the current news, there are a couple of scientists in the United States that are saying COVID remains in the air in very tiny droplets for a longer period of time than we understood. And they're saying uh, the World Health Organization needs to recognize this. And the World Health Organization is saying, show us your science. So they, they have to move very carefully. It would be as if you were to say hydroxychloroquine or whatever is, uh, you know, is an effective treatment. You would have to say, I need to look at the research and let's look at it together even if that would help your patient. So hoarding can be a response. Um, and other behaviors, of course, related to fear and worry. Uh, bought everything in the grocery store on a large scale. Uh, you avoided people from countries where coronavirus cases occurred, such as China or Italy. Racism increases with fear and worry in these kinds of circumstances in um, uh, health uh, um, pandemics. Exercise less than I usually did. You know, I didn't go out of the house. I was scared to go out of the house for the first probably two or three weeks. Um, so I was using my exercise bike, but um, I exercise less. Uh, how many people bought um, personal protection equipment? Um, now, related to fear and worry, also, people drink more alcohol than usual. They eat more unhealthy foods. I remember, uh, um, I don't know whether it was Facebook or somewhere, I saw somebody talking about all of the uh, high-calorie foods that they were able to eat before 9 a.m. in the morning. So these are the kinds of behaviors that are actually reflective of fear and worry, which can be reduced 
with a clear and consistent message about what the risk is and what you can do to protect yourself. Uh, you may have avoided going to the doctor with issues that could be postponed. And in some sense, that may have been uh, out of your hands because everybody went to telehealth, but you may have postponed the telehealth visit as well. Um, you may have bought drugs that people were saying on the internet might be good for treatment, when in fact they had absolutely no effect. You may be looking at online advertisements for um, drugs that have no proven effect on any anything to do with COVID. So, if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them as best I can. Um, I am going to share this. Oh, uh, Dr. Tally. Yes. Dr. Dr. Agbas has a question. Dr. Agbas. Uh, hi, Dr. Tally. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting about this fear factor that uh, the authorities is providing the trustable and reliable information for the citizens. However, the media is uncontrollable. And in, in I mean, we have seen in the first hand experiences during the pandemic that all different medias, all different media outlets in providing and fueling the sometimes semi-correct, correct or incorrect mostly the information that really um, fuels the anxiety and the worrisome uh, yes. situation to the people. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, we can't really help on it. You know, we can't just <laughs> say the media. Okay, for example, Doctor um, uh, D'Agostino said that. Okay, don't watch the you know the media. Just uh, look at the, what the CDC says about the pandemic rates and death and these because this is a kind of more uh, uh, you know the uh, authoritative uh, institution. I don't know. I mean, uh, can you share your thoughts about with us uh, about this issue? I think it's How an we can do that, but it's way. it's a tempting. Okay, what's going on in the newspaper? What's going on in the uh, television, radio, etc. Well, for one thing, the uh, the White House briefings are fairly problematic um, because they are not consistent always with science. There seems to be a, a constant struggle between, um, uh, you know, some of the people who are present there. Uh, so reducing that is a good idea. Um, and in fact, I think probably um, in some instances uh, where Dr. Fauci was going directly to Congress and making announcements and talking was probably a better idea than the press briefings. Um, that's that's not necessarily the best venue for that. Um, I think uh, announcements, for instance, um, being able to, to detect false sites are very important. Uh, Johns Hopkins is a very reliable source of information, but in fact, um, someone was able to modify their logo and send out some misinformation. And so a consistent, organized, message is what is best. And World Health Organization is doing this all over the world. Uh, they're no longer allowed to do that here, but CDC is relying on, on information from World Health Organization. So I think in part, as physicians, you sharing, for instance, uh, CDC has announcements that they send out. You can sign up for announcements. You can sign up for those links. Um, telling them where to go for the good information, for the accurate information. That's a part that you can play as a, as a physician. Um, flyers um, at the, um, you know, in the reception area. Um, and, and, and always saying, we don't know everything. So if you don't know what the actual correct information is saying that, we don't know that yet. We're working on it. Um, giving people who are interested links to the places where they can go and look at an actual study. Or um, Mayo Clinic has wonderful information on their sites. NIH has wonderful information. Uh, and so, so giving your patients 
links to these valid uh, information sources is an excellent idea. Dr. Talley. Yes. Dr. Mike Johnson has a question. Dr. Johnson. Okay. Hi, Dr. Johnston. Hello there, Dr. Talley. First of all, I want to compliment you on your presentation. I honestly thought that your slides were very succinct. You have good command and uh, depth of knowledge, and they weren't busy, but they were very filled with high yield uh, content. So I Thank thought you. the slide presentation was, was spot on. I thought that also, as I listen to this, it, it does reinforce a lot of uh, good common sense and professionalism and just good relationships with people, whether it's doctor, patient, uh, etc. cetera. Um, that trust factor is priceless. And I think the hardest thing sometimes, you know, medicine, there's, there's a science to it. There's no question about it. But the application of it is a true art. And to import or to impart the art with the patient is, um, is, is time consuming, yet is high yield reward in the long run. Uh, so therein lies the the uh, the high yield value of that time that you spend both patient and with the doc. I think some of the hardest parts of getting the word comply across is uh, having realistic goals, and the goal side of it on the patient's part is I just want to be. I just want you to fix me. I just want this to go away. I want to be the way I used to be. Yep. And that's a hard sell. And it's hard to come up with a rationale based on evidence based. It's hard to do that and still have good outcomes. So you're absolutely right, Jan. Everything you have said. I respect and agree with you. Um, it's it's sometimes just harder to do than it is to say. Um, but your content, I really appreciate it. I thought it was spot on. Thank you. Um, I I I um, started out working with adolescents on an inpatient psych unit with um, uh, treatment adherence and medication compliance. And I remember when I got that grant from the mental health levy, and as I was walking away, <laughs> the head of the committee said, well, good luck with that one. And um, because adolescents are notoriously noncompliant. And one of the ways, and we're actually using this now down in Joplin, one of the ways that I developed the curriculum for the adolescents was that I involved the adolescents in the development of the curriculum. So we tried out videos. Um, and they said whether they liked them or not. And they seemed to like the videos the best that had teenagers talking. Now, this was post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I found a video with a teenager talking about what it was like. Um, and, and that helped enormously. And not only that, but they began to feel like experts. And this is that whole incredibly powerful uh, uh, movement for patient participation, patient as expert, patient as part of the treatment team, they are the expert in their responses. And, you know, you may not always get them to track their responses every day, but they may over time begin to pay attention to certain things. And I remember um, in Crittenton, where that study took place, when we first started out, we would hear this phrase, when I get out of here, I'm going, going cold turkey. So they're going to get rid of their psychotropic meds. And these were kids that were really seriously problematic. Um, and, and they needed the medication. They couldn't live out in the normal community without them. And so that was a big deal, that they were going to be here. We get them stabilized, and out they go, and <clears throat> they'd be right back. 
So we, we, uh, I did a, uh, I think it was six or eight week course. And in the course of that time, they began to learn behaviors that gave them control over their treatment because with adolescents, that's what they're doing. They're moving into adulthood. They're becoming more independent. And if you encourage that, that can be powerful. You can really get them to become a part of it by bringing them into the decision-making process. Well, how does this medication make you feel? Now, you and most docs do that with adults. And with teens, it's even more important. Um, I know my son, who's now a clinical psychologist, um, has ADHD. And it's all right if I tell you, he's fine with that. But in practice, um, his pediatrician, who began prescribing him uh, Rital Ritalin, yeah, Ritalin, um, began to teach him what the medication was doing from the time he was six years old. He's been on it the whole time. He has never abused it, and he has actually been able to use it as a tool, just as a tool. And that was one of the things that I stressed with the with the uh, the kids, the adolescent kids. Was medication's a tool. It's not you. It's a tool. So developing those kinds of things. We, used, we taught them how to, how do you talk to the doctor? How do you ask questions? We went around to senior centers in the Kansas City area and found that the older adults, they think physicians are gods and they're not going to challenge you. And if you cut them off when they're saying why they came there, that's it. They're done because they're not going to interrupt. And that you are in charge and you are as close to God as they're ever going to come and they will do, they will just fade away. And that's, that's one of the things is to bring them into the decision-making. And I know Dr. Johnson, you're really good at that because I've watched you do it. <laughs> Dr. Talley. Yes. Michael Fila has a question. Michael. Yeah. I wanted to just sort of follow up on what Dr. Agbas had mentioned. Um, in the beginning of this whole pandemic, in March, they yeah. were saying, you know, no face masks, face masks don't make a dis difference. And uh, then, now, here we are, and face masks make a difference. So, mm -hmm. you know, that conflicting information, and it was, it came from the top. It wasn't that it was like the media said it. It came from the top. So I think that that's something that also, you, you know, your talk um, demonstrates. And and so people, and then you have, as you said, you know, our administration basically saying, I'm not going to wear a mask. So it, it's a difficult societal thing. Um, and then just to touch on another thing, um, I know glucophage. Um, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. What? Uh, glucophage, metformin, it with food is necessary. And a lot of people stop taking it because oh, it made me feel terrible. And that difference between following the instructions and taking it with food, but you know, again, the physician may have said, thought they said and they told them how to do this, but in the end, they don't take it because it makes me feel bad. So anyway, those are just two comments that um, I kind of got from your talk. And thank you very much. It was a, it was very informative. Thank Dr. you, Tally. Doctor Tally, Shelley Boyer has a question. Go ahead, oh. Shelley. Hi, Doctor Tally. Thank you for the talk. That was really good, um, and I hope that. <laughs> any of the uh, student doctors listening are really going to take away what I did from it. And that's, you know, communication being a big, a big key to building the relationship with your patients or with your um, participants in a research study. And so my question is sort of one based on more from research, you know, I think that it's easier for physicians to build relationships with um, 
with people in an office in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, I think it's harder when you're talking about larger research, especially when um, people can't be referred by their name, they're a number, because it's a blind study or, um, you know, they're, they're, well, basically in a lot of research studies, you just don't go by name. And so to try to get buy-in on these types of studies, what advice would you give to um, young researchers, scientific, or even in your own area of psychology on how do you get that buy-in from people if you can't get on a first name basis or in a one-on-one -on -one situation with them? So, so there can't be any communication between the researcher and the patient? No, I mean, there is like sort of, well, I mean, in the case of ours, I mean, if you imagine that we would have gotten some buy-in through our recruitment, but maintaining that buy-in, it would have been building relationships with those, with those adolescents during the educational and during the yoga. And in our case, you know, they're assigned a number. So um, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult because there's never that one-on-one. -on -one. Now it becomes more of a group setting. And so maybe just the advice you could get on how you would continue to involve them or try to build that relationship, even if you have to take it to a group kind of study setting. Well, first of all, um, I'm, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't be able to know their name, but that said, um, there are a couple of different ways you can continue to, to help them um, become a part of the treatment. And one might be satisfaction surveys over medication, uh, over uh, you, can, you can give them tracking sheets and actually um, call them to remind them about the tracking sheets. You can, there are a lot of different ways actually that physicians can improve compliance without taking any of their time. I know that at Swope Health Services, um, they hired a group uh, who were uh, working with people with um, uh, diabetes. And those folks would, they were given a certain number of patients. And yes, the patients came in and saw their doctors as um, prescribed, but they also were, they took turns being on call for the patients. The, um, I think they were called patient educators. Uh, they most of them had like uh, either an RN or an LPN, and they actually were doing patient education. They were sharing recipes. They were doing all kinds of things. And if one person found a recipe and said, "Oh, this is really good," those kinds of things that bring the patient in, where the patient's real life is, you know, what can I eat? What tastes good? Um, I want to get back to good food. Well, maybe you can't go to those bad foods. You're going to have to find some new ones, but um, supporting that new uh, lifestyle. Now, what you're also pointing out is after the study's over, does the protocol sustain itself? And that is the hardest one, long-term sustainability. So when you're building a treatment protocol, that's why physicians will very often look at what in the environment can I enlist? Um, you know, is there a caregiver at home? Is there a parent? Is there someone close to this person who lives with them that can support them in some way, whether it's bringing them to treatment or whatever? But you have to be constantly vigilant about what are the, the supports that can be created. And nurses are really good at this. The receptionist in an office can be wonderful. I know my daughter... Um, her uh, dentist had a bunch of recipes that were, you know, healthy in her waiting room. And so my daughter would come home with these, <laughs> these wonderful new recipes. But setting up every moment you have with them, not just the phys physician one-on-one, -on -one, but the waiting room. Now, you remember how most pediatricians will have some sort of video um, going for the kids to... Um, you know, keep them quiet while they're waiting. Well, a video about uh, hand washing, a video about um, viruses. There's a terrific video out there explaining viruses. And it's, it's so entertaining. It's about an hour long. 
show that. I think you're, you're so right, Dr. Talley. Buy-in. It's buy-in at every yeah. level and every opportunity that you can get before the study, during the study, and after the study yeah. or the, the doctor visit. So the information you've given is great. I appreciate the talk, and I I love working with you. So um, <laughs> thank you for thank you for doing this for us today. Thank you. Dr. Talley. Yes. Dr. Ogbas has a question. Dr. Ogbas. Uh, hi, that's me again. Uh, there is a new um, new style of communication between the physician and patients. The patients now uh, learn a lot of things about their conditions and then going to the physician's office prepared, you know, the asking about the Dr. Google and then getting all sort of information. Some of them are com because the patients may not see the what results are reliable or what informations are unreliable. They just get that one. So, but what happens to me? Okay, uh, the because I consider my uh, primary care physician highly educated and medical doctor or DO. And then they are on the top of their field. So he and me and I'm coming and I'm asking the, some, uh, um, you know, the either the controversial or the interviewing questions. So you know the so now the somehow the sometimes uh, the physicians felt that you know, I'm being challenged. You know that this is coming with the well prepared yes. over my head. So psychological point of view, what would be the, your suggestion between the, a healthy relationship between the uh, physician and the visiting uh, patients? Because uh, for the patient's point of view, being prepared and going to the doctor's office is good. But however, when you are sharing this information with the physician, a physician may or may not receive the, the same way that, okay, you know, it's a kind of sign sitting, you know, we can just uh, learn from one another, but he, because he's sitting in the authority level that, okay, I'll make that decision mm -hmm. about your treatment, medication, and so on and so on. A psychological point of view, I'm just curious about that. Can you comment and on that issue? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's not, that's not going to lead to compliance. That's not going to lead to participation in the treatment protocol listening, listening to the patient's concerns, every single one of them. Remember, it was only six seconds longer. So physicians have to do that, and good physicians do. However, my advice, if a physician doesn't, I've never had a physician who was not interested in what I had <laughs> to say. Now, that could be me, but um, on the other hand, I wouldn't go back to that physician. I'd find a physician who would listen. Okay, everybody, I think it's time that we unmute and, and unmask ourselves and thank our, our speaker this week, Dr. Jan Talley. Thank you so much. Yeah. Again, so next week will be uh, Dr. Paulson, followed by Dr. McNabb. We'll get his second seminar in this series. And again, I've recruited uh, successfully uh, the director of the Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Toby Teeter to come to this uh, venue and give us a talk on a, a topic of his choice. Now I'd like to turn it over to um, Ms. Shelley Boyer to uh, promote our uh, COVID-19 Journal Club tomorrow. Shelley.